I greet all the women of South Africa on this very special, auspicious day, the 9th of August, Women's Day. Today, as men and as women, we celebrate the beautiful mothers of our nation, our sisters, who are also beautiful, our grandmothers, who are outstandingly beautiful, and our daughters, who are extraordinarily beautiful. Together, we thank the women of South Africa for the role that they have played in the life of our nation. And the role of women in our country has been phenomenal. Today, we celebrate how far we have come in building a non-sexist society where women, and we are striving to ensure that women become freer and attain that moment, Minister Zamini Zuma, of total freedom, where women and we are doing this, we are inspiring that women should enjoy equal rights to those of men as guaranteed by our Constitution. As we do this, we recall the suffering that the women of our country have endured for no reason other than that they were women. And of course, they have also suffered under another form of oppression, which is because the majority of them are black or were black during the apartheid days, and also because they came from the working class stock. We remember the courageous struggles waged by women against oppression from those who stood up against colonialism and slavery to those who risked jail, the hated Dom Pass or the Pass. We remember those women who took up arms against the violent regime, who organized workers to fight exploitation, and who led political movements as well as civic movements and who were involved in the drafting also of our new constitution. Today, of all days, we salute Imbokoto Amakawegazi, the brave pioneers who marched onto the Union buildings here on this day in 1956. There are few moments more compelling in our history than the day when tens of thousands of women gathered in the amphitheater of these union buildings. I often tell people that whenever we had visits from other countries, when heads of state come here, I always take them to what we have put at the union buildings to symbolize that march on the Union buildings, two rocks, one forming the base and one inside the base as a grinding stone. And I always take time to tell them in some detail about the march of 20,000 women on the Union buildings. We are still moved by the images of women like Lillian Goy, Rahima Musa, Sophie De Brain, and Helen Joseph, carrying armfuls of petitions from the women of South Africa. I still remember that picture where Mama De Brain was carrying these reams of papers, beautiful as she still looks today. We are honored and privileged to have amongst us today 
this remarkable woman, Auntie Sophie de Brain. We are grateful for your lifetime of service and your continued contribution to the cause of women's emancipation. And all of us, Mama de Brain, we say thank you. Thank you for the sacrifices that you and those who were with you made to get us where we are. The women marched here to the union buildings to the seat of the apartheid power to demand the end to laws that were intended to deprive them of their rights and dignity as black women. Today, all the women of South Africa, whether they are black, white, Indian, or colored, do have rights that we can celebrate today. We thank them for the bravery of activism and sacrifices of that generation of 1956. Thanks to the struggle over the generations, all South African women have the right to vote today, which women did not have. They have the right to work a right that was restricted or limited just to menial jobs and domestic work. They have the right to have control over their bodies, the right also to property and to be able to own assets, even though that right is still restricted. On this Women's Day, we pay tribute to Imbogoto from across South Africa for their resilience. Despite the hardships, the deprivation, and the many difficulties, South African women continue to stand strong. They bring up the nation. The children are brought up, all of us were brought up by the women of South Africa. And we must celebrate that. And we must thank the women of our country for making us to be what we are today. We say thank you very much. Indeed, you are the mothers of the nation. The women of our country today run businesses. They earn livings. They learn skills. They raise families. And they lead organizations. And today, they also hold public office. Even when opportunities are difficult to come by, South African women do give up, do not give up rather. They do not run away. They do not succumb. They actually stick to the job because, as it is often said, bom me kapo basadi ba tswara tipa kabo haling bayona. A free translation meaning the women of South Africa hold the life on its sharp end. That's the determination that the women of our country have, and we applaud you for that. We applaud the women of our country for the courage that they have. In every part of this country, women are taking charge of their destinies. They are also inspiring others, and they are also driving change. They are excelling in areas once close to women, as engineers, as scientists, as managers, as pilots, as farmers, as athletes, as soldiers. And when it comes to soldiers, that's when I admire them the most because I always see them on Armed Forces Day carrying the very big guns with lipstick on their mouths and I always wonder, lipstick and a big gun, how do the two connect? But the women of our country have broken into those areas. And today in Durban and Kabecha, the women of our country under Transnet 
they are now shepherding seven vessels into the sea in an all-women crew. The women of the country are forging into areas that we never thought they would be. They are captains, they are pilots, they are on fighter jets, and they are going into various areas. So women are the strength of our nation. They carry our nation, and the women of our country prepare the next generation for a better future. And as a country, we have come a long way in advancing the rights of women. This is largely due to the struggles that the women of our country waged and continue to wage. And on this, I will say to the women of our country, never ever stop and never ever give up. You must continue the pressure to ensure that women do get their due right in this country. That we must continue to do. Because in the end, the women of our country, being the majority population section in our country, have to get what is due to them. And also, there is the question that the women of our country have raised repeatedly, and this is about representation. The women of our country have dis demanded that they need to be represented in every endeavor that affects the lives of South Africans. And they have clearly said nothing about them without them being involved. And this must become a reality. Because without these types of insistence and struggle, we would not be where we are. Since the advent of democracy, in 1994, we have put policies and laws in place to empower women to improve their lives and to advance gender equality. And we see some of these, we see the advancement, we see how women are searching forward. South Africa has one of the highest literacy rates in our region on the continent. There is parity between girls and boys in primary school enrollment. More female learners sit for metric than males. Female learners are achieving more bachelor passes. And one could actually safely say, women are proving to be cleverer than men. And we applaud this. Yes, you only need to go to check the metric results. You will see that the young girls are surging forward. So, Premier, girls and women are cleverer than you and me. So, let's accept that. <laughs> young women make up the majority of students enrolled in higher education institutions, in our colleges and in our universities. And we should encourage this and make sure that this goes on and advances forward. We want to see an increase, yes, in the representation of women in all respects. In our parliament, yes, we are seeing more and more women being represented. In the judiciary, we are seeing more and more women surging forward in public service, in the armed forces, as well as in the police, and in many local councils, we are getting closer and closer to gender parity. In the cabinet that I lead, there is parity between men and women, and we have made sure that we will keep that 50-50 balance in the cabinet of the Republic of South Africa. In order to advance the lives of women, 
there must be policies and laws that focus and advance the women of our country. Our laws and policies must have a bias towards improving the lives of women. And we would like to see as we draft our laws to ensure that we use a microscope to see how best the interests and the lives of our women can be improved. And that is a process that the women who sit in my cabinet, that the women who sit in our parliament are also beginning to make sure that it happens. Because in the end, this will deal a blow against patriarchy in places where patriarchy still exists. And so we want to see that happening. In our education system, we do want and intend and are advancing and prioritizing the role and participation of women. And we want young women to make up the majority in the various disciplines that are offered by our institutions of higher learning. We still, however, have a problem with girls dropping out of school, often to, due to difficulties at home, as a society and as families, and as a nation, we must ensure that our girls stay at school and that they finish school. And I call upon parents to ensure that our girls do stay at schools and do continue to higher levels of education because our government has made it its task to ensure that there's appropriate funding for the children and the young people of our country at institutions of education. The health of women must be a key priority as well. We should remember it was President Nelson Mandela who decided right at the dawn of our democracy that pregnant women and children under six should get free health care. We have advanced even much further since 1994. Women's health outcomes continue to improve as a result of progressive policies around reproductive health, antenatal care, HIV, AIDS, and other communicable diseases. Even though women's health outcomes have improved by a number of indicators, women still carry the largest share of burden of HIV and are more vulnerable to sexually transmitted diseases. Despite our laws, women and girls in many parts of this country still struggle to access reproductive health services. And this has to improve. And our health services need to be more accessible. And this is a priority that our Department of Health will also be focusing attention on. The participation of women in our economy must also be improved. Our economy remains dominated by men. More women are unemployed than men. When you look at our unemployment figures, you find that it is more women who are unemployed than men. And this has become and is a priority for our government. Women are more likely to work part-time. They are more likely to be unskilled and semi-skilled. And they get much lower pay than men. And women are disproportionately responsible for unpaid care work. And it is in this area where we say there must be equal pay for equal work and women can no longer be paid lower than men for the same work that they do. <laughs> Minister, we must now advance to, yes, ensuring that there is a law that will ban 
discriminatory pay between men and women for the same job. We should now, we will now pilot because it is inherently unjust, it's inherently unfair. And we also see this with the underpayment of our women sports people. And I will deal with that in a little while. We saw that last year, or was it earlier this year, it was last year when the women won the African Cup of Nations. And in the end, we found that they were being paid less than men. And I made a call then that there must be equality of payment between men and women at that level. In fact, right now, I'm sure you will all join me. They should actually be getting more paid because they perform better than our men. So as a result of all this, women are more vulnerable to poverty, to food insecurity, and to hunger. Even today, nearly three decades after the dawn of democracy, the face of poverty is still the face of a black woman. And that also must be changed. The emancipation of women, therefore, cannot be achieved without economic empowerment. Women must be breadwinners. They must have equal job opportunities. They must be able to start and own and manage their own businesses. Women need to have financial security and independence to have control over their lives. We are determined to make the most available resources to make a difference in the lives of young women, women with disabilities, rural women, as well as LGBTQI plus women. We are making a difference in the lives of women who are involved in small, medium enterprises, in cooperatives, and also in the informal sector. Among other things, government is supporting women's economic empowerment through public procurement. We have made a commitment as government to allocate at least 40% of public procurement to women-owned businesses. And Minister Zamini Zuma is looking at a various number of mechanisms to make sure that this does happen, including up to moving to a level where we will have regulations and legal as well as legislative precepts, prescripts that will ensure that indeed the women of our country do get empowered. While government departments are working in earnest to award more contracts to women-owned businesses, we need to do much more. As things stand, less than a third of the companies listed on the government central supplier database are women-owned. We want this to change. We have trained more than 6,000 women entrepreneurs to take part in public procurement opportunities. The success of this program has convinced me of the need to train more and more women entrepreneurs in their thousands. When I was given the report that we have only trained 6,000, I said I want tens and tens of thousands of women to be trained in this way. The African Continental Free Trade Area, which is now in implementation mode, will give women-owned businesses in our country and across the African continent access to new markets and opportunities. And this is precisely where we want our women to participate and we want to strengthen their hand and to have them well prepared and well trained and well 
resource to be able to participate in this. We are working with partners on opportunities for women's employment and entrepreneurship in agriculture, in manufacturing, in technology, and also the oceans, economy, and others. The green economy presents immense potential for women's entrepreneurship and empowerment, especially in renewable energy. In a number of cities and towns, there are many women who are established as green entrepreneurs, working in recycling, in greening, in climate smart agriculture, and in a number of other avenues. We call on the business community to support women's economic empowerment by partnering with small businesses that are led and owned by women as part of their green economy plans. There is also immense opportunity for young women in public employment initiatives. Since it was established in 2020, the Presidential Employment Stimulus has provided work and livelihood support and opportunities to more than 1.2 million people